Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar about new pluripotent stem cell based cellular models for high throughput screens to identify and characterize therapeutic candidates. We will start with a brief introduction on the current models used for toxicology screening, and we will see what are the advantages that new cellular models, such as cells derived from pluripotent stem cells, can have. Starting from this, we will then go through the main three features that we always need to keep in mind when working with stem cell-derived cellular models, and that allow us to guarantee experimental success and reproducibility. At first, we will focus on the maintenance of the undifferentiated stem cell line itself, and we will see how important it is to apply good culturing practices. By taking as an example the generation of cardiomyocyte from human prepotent stem cells, we will address different possibilities to standardize and reduce variability during the differentiation of these cells, so that in the end we can achieve a good experimental representation. Finally, my colleague Laura will introduce you to the quality control steps that are necessary during the whole process to ensure the good reliability of the cellular model and how these steps can be fastened and simplified. But let's start. As you know, appropriate toxicity studies are mandatory for the commercialization of any new drug. This is, of course, required to ensure the highest possible safety for all the future patients. Nevertheless, the overall process of drug development is extremely lengthy and also economically demanding, even at the early stages. So, if a possible new drug fails to fulfill some of these requirements, this is, of course, resulting in a conspicuous economical loss and wasted time and effort. Unfortunately, um, these failures are not rare events. We know, in fact, that about 90% of all new drugs fail clinical trials, and half of these failures are due to toxicity that have not been detected in preclinical stage. On the other hand, it is unknown at the moment how many potentially effective substances are not being developed further because they are falsely quantified as toxic. So, of course, this led to the understanding that new and more predictive model system for drug discovery and to predict human toxic effects are highly desirable. At the moment, animal models are mostly used. Unfortunately, um, although they have several advantages, we cannot forget that they have also uh, important predictive limitations. These limitations are mostly due to interspecies differences, since, as we know, animal models can differ from human models in terms of physiology and metabolism which in return can, can lead uh, to differences in uh, drug effects between animals and humans. And unfortunately, uh, we have some sad examples of this problem. So drugs that had no toxic effect on animals, but had them on humans. And I'm sure you are all familiar with the case of thalidomide and with the more recent one of teralizumab. Going more into detail uh, in regards of cardiac effects, we know that animal models show also differences in electrophysiological properties. Finally, we cannot forget that using animal models can also raise some ethical concerns. And as strongly favored by the 3R principle drawn by the European Medicine Agency in 2010, everyone in this field should make an effort in replacing animal testing with non-animal methods when possible in reducing the number of animals used and refining the test. So the obvious answer to this problem would be, of course, to use directly human primary cardiomyocytes. But unfortunately, adult human cardiomyocytes neither survive nor proliferate very well when isolated from the heart in vivo. So we need something else. 
a new possible opportunity can be represented by induced pluripotent stem cells, also known as iPS cells or iPSCs. Um, in fact, these cells can be generated directly from a, an already differentiated somatic cell uh, that can be then induced to differentiate into any cell type of the human body. So we start by collecting samples from human donors, so either skin biopsies or urine or blood samples. Then we introduce specific genes uh, during a process called reprogramming, and we convert the somatic cell into pluripotent stem cell. We can then go on, and by adding cytokines and small molecules, we obtain the differentiation of a specific cell type, such as, for example, neurons or hepatocytes or cardiomyocytes, just to give you some uh, examples of common uh, PSC-derived cell types. So um, the um, stem cell technology is relatively new and was actually pioneered uh, by the Yamana uh, lab just in 2006. Since their first um, paper, the pluripotent stem cell field has seen enormous advances and these cells find important applications in the study of the etiology of a disease so disease modeling, in cell replacement therapies, as well as cellular models for drug discovery and toxicity screening. Why pluripotent stem cell-derived models can represent an advantage also in drug screening and phenotyping? Well, first of all, because these cells are human-based models. Moreover, we can obtain lines from donors with specific and disease-relevant genetic backgrounds and evaluate compounds directly on healthy or diseased lines. On the practical side, PSCs represent an unlimited cell source that can be scaled up or can be banked. Finally, and importantly, uh, on a functional level, several studies have been done. For example, in regard of iPSC-derived cardiomyocyte, uh, it's known that after exposure to cardiac tropic compounds, they show alteration in viability, in contractility, um, in the electrophysiology, and so on. Moreover, they can be used to test a very important and lethal model of arrhythmia that is often drug-induced, the so-called torsade pond. This is a possible side effect of new compounds that by lengthening the QT interval uh, induce a specific type of uh, abnormal heart rhythm that in human can lead to sudden cardiac death. For this certain pseudogenic risk assessment use, uh, several uh, um, regulatory agencies have started their evaluation. Finally, they have been successfully tested in regard of the predictivity uh, of cardiac toxicity caused by anti-cancer drugs. So given the fact that they are still recent, uh, PSC-derived cardiomyocyte models still show some limitation. In fact, the overall phenotype shown by these cells is more resembling the phenotype of a fetal human cardiomyocyte rather than a adult one. Second, at this stage, there is still a lack of standardization within the field, and this, of course, results in a phenotypical variation uh, of the cellular model itself, and, of course, in lower predictivity. So, is there anything that can be done at this stage to try to limit this variability? Yes, we can improve the reliability of the cellular model in three ways. One, by starting and maintaining high-quality PSC lines. Two, by having a standardized workflow for differentiation of cardiomyocytes. And last but not least, by performing a stringent quality control. We will see each of these points in detail in the next slides. So let's see first how to culture and maintain high-quality pluripotent stem cell master lines. Why do we put so much highlight on the high quality of the undifferentiated stem cell use? 
Well, this is because PSCs are very sensitive cells. And when in culture, some of their feature must be taken into consideration. In fact, if incorrectly handled or if maintained in unfitting regions, they will react quickly to the stressor and lose their key stem cell characteristic. A first sign of the loss of pluripotency of line is a deviation from the classical morphology that you can see here on the um, upper right. Normally, uh, these cells grow as homogeneous monolayers of culture, really tightly packed within each other, forming colonies with sharp and distinctive borders. If incorrectly cultured, they will lose their pluripotency and they will change quickly this morphology in a process that is called spontaneous differentiation, of which you can see uh, two examples here below. This represents, of course, a big issue because uh, lines that don't show their fully pluripotent potential cannot be used for differentiation. Therefore, having a robust and stable culture environment is a fundamental requisite for successful culture and consequently experiments. This is the reason why um, appropriate reagents should be used for all key steps during PSC culture. And this is also what we kept in mind while developing our workflow for culture and maintenance of pluripotent stem cell lines. In fact, all our um, products have been developed to have a xenon-free formulation, so they don't contain any uh, ingredients that come from different species other than the one that is uh, cultured at the moment. They also have high quality ingredients that of course are QC tested. And importantly, they have also been tested for being compatible uh, within each other. So a major element in a PSC culture is of course the culture in media itself. A robust PSC culture media must support consistent cell growth without compromising the maintenance of a stem cell specific characteristic. So what are these key characteristics we should monitor for? So first of all, as we said in the beginning, a good media allows PSC to maintain their typical morphology. Here, you can see the morphology of lines cultured in Stemmax PSC group Ceph. As you may see, uh, cells grown with this media show typical morphology, and they also display classic and consistently stable doubling times of 22, 27 hours over consecutive passages. Second, a robust medium uh, should support and allow high and persistent expression of pluripotency markers. Also, when PSCs are maintained in culture for a longer time. Here, you may see the assessment of this feature um, by flow cytometric analysis of um, pluripotency associated markers at different passages. So all the cell lines that we have tested display high and persistent expression of TRA160, CA4, OC34, and TOX2 that are all marker, uh, markers associated with a pluripotent state. And they show, conversely, uh, only low expression of CA1 that is an early differentiation marker. At the same time, the media should allow the cell to maintain their full pluripotency also on a functional level, and don't introduce any bias in the differentiation capabilities of our lines. We assess this feature by testing if PSC lines cultured in Stemmax PSC group can differentiate into cell types that derive from the three embryonic germ layers. Um, we did that by using a specific kit, the Stemmax 3 lineage differentiation kit. So here you can see uh, the results from our quantitative flow cytometry analysis that confirmed the ability of cells cultured in this media to differentiate into smooth mascot cells and endothelial precursors, so for the 
mesodermal lineage, in definitive endoderm cells, and in narrow ectodermal cells for the ectoderm layer. Finally, we know that PSC tend to acquire genetic aberration in prolonged uh, culture. So, and this happens, of course, uh, especially if they are mishandled. The genomic stability of the cells that were maintained in our medium was analyzed by karyotyping and more in detail by evaluating the burden of copy number variants. Both methods revealed a stable karyotype for these cells. Finally, um, after talking uh, a lot about important feature to maintain our uh, cells happy, uh, let's add something that makes also the researcher happy. So as I just said, PSC um, have distinctive metabolic demands and don't tolerate stress. So this is the reason why normally um, and classically media changes have been uh, performed with 24 hour interval. But by using new generation cell culture media, such as the Max PSC group, more flexible feeding schedules can be applied. So you can either choose the classical everyday feeding, or you can opt for uh, every other day feeding, or even nicer, you can skip feeding on the weekends, so you do not have to go back to the, to the lab also on weekends. Okay. So now that we made sure that we use just highly pluripotent stem cell lines, let's see how we can differentiate them into cardiomyocytes and how to increase the consistency of this process. So PSC differentiation is achieved by a sequential addition of pathogenic factors, so cytokines and small molecules, in a media that is formulated for the metabolic requirement of the target cell type. Key factors during this process are, the, of course, the combination of the patterning uh, factors that we add, their concentration and timing. And the overall protocol uh, tries to recapitulate all the signaling events that happen on an embryonal and fatal stage and lead to cell fate specification. So, for example, uh, robust cardiomyocyte uh, generation can be achieved by sequential modulation of these signaling. But of course, uh, the process is more complex than what it might look like, and there are still several challenges that researchers face. First of all, there is still not one unique uh, standard protocol for differentiation of cardiomyocytes. And the differentiation media are often self-prepared, and this is a practice that is prone to human error, and it's also prone to the lot-to-lot -lot variation uh, that we uh, normally have uh, in the single ingredients of this media. Moreover, the final culture that we obtain uh, after differentiation uh, is usually heterogeneous. So uh, it's composed both by correctly differentiated cells, uh, but also by cells that didn't correctly differentiate. And the percentage uh, of this population can vary uh, in each differentiation round. And of course, the experimental um, readout is also influenced, influenced by this. So PSC research needs solutions to improve the differentiation and frequency and increase standardization. How can we address it? So we suggest two types of solutions. First of all, we suggest the use of ready-to-use media kit for a standardized differentiation process. Second, we suggest to use isolation strategies to enrich the differentiated cell population and increase experimental consistency. Having those uh, two criteria in mind, we have developed a specific workflow for differentiation of pluripotent stem cells into cardiomyocytes. All regions have been designed to work within each other and um, all media formulation are, again, xeno-free formulation, and in this case, they do not contain phenol red, so that fluorescence and absorbance based assay are also possible. So our first advice was to opt for ready-to-use media kits for the differentiation when available. This, in fact, reduces operator errors, 
eliminates inconsistency due to lot-to-lot -lot variation of the reagents, and in general, um, it eases the creation of the experimental model, so it gives more time to focus on the actual experimental application. For this purpose, we have developed a new uh, media kit, the Stenmax Cardio Diff Kit XF, uh, that has been designed to standardize this type of differentiation and to work uh, in just eight days. This is a complete and ready-to-use kit uh, that allows the differentiation of PFC in either atrial or ventricular cardiomyocyte and works both in two-dimensional or three-dimensional culture. So in this slide, you may see a graphic representation of the protocol. So the kit is composed of three media that uh, progressively restrict the cellular fate and is, um, promote the differentiation into cardiomyocyte um, in just eight days of culture. The induction of a specific cardiac subtype is achieved from day three to five. So if we use the unsupplemented medium, we will have the differentiation of ventricular-like cells, whereas if we supplement it with retinoic acid, uh, we will have atrial-like cardiomyocytes. So substantial changes on the cellular morphology are observable during the differentiation, and depending on the cellular line, the first contracting cardiomyocyte can be observed already after just six days of culture, and the overall differentiation protocol uh, lasts until day eight. So cardiomyocytes that have been generated with this kit, of course, show phenotypical characteristics that are consistent with their cellular fate. So here, for example, you may see uh, a characterization done by flow uh, cytometry, uh, reporting the expression of the cardiac marker, uh, cardiac troponin D, alpha uh, actinin, and alpha myosin heavy chain. Uh, below, you may see the results of immunofluorescence staining. And again, cardiomyocytes generated with this kit show the expression of both potassium channels and of cardiac phospholamban that it's known to uh, modulate the contractility of the heart muscle. We have of course also evaluated the differentiation efficiency. As we will see later, it's extremely unlikely that PSC differentiation will lead to a 100% correctly differentiated cells. Uh, but of course, the higher the differentiation efficiency is, the better. To assess this, we have evaluated the number of cells that express uh, the classic, classic cardiac troponin marker in uh, um, different lines and after different experiments. As you may see, we obtain high differentiation efficiency with uh, good experiment-to-experiment -experiment consistency. Our data also show that the efficiency rate is not influenced by the scale of differentiation, and therefore it can be scaled up. So, as we mentioned, there are different types of cardiomyocytes that will um, form the muscular walls of the heart, so the myocardium. We have developed our kit so that it was possible to obtain either atrial or ventricular cardiomyocyte. And this is because these two um, subtypes show actually uh, pretty different uh, properties uh, in terms of electrophysiology and also on an expression level. So it's therefore important to know which subtype we have in our culture dish uh, in order to better evaluate the effect of a compound on, on our cellular model. Yeah? Because, of course, the um, reply of the cellular model is different, either if it is a ventricular or if it is an atrial-like cell. This different phenotype was uh, um, evaluated and demonstrated here, um, as you can see, uh, where we report the expression of either ventricular or atrial specific genes, uh, both by uh, quantitative PCR and also by immunofluorescence staining.
Another feature of this differentiation kit is that you can also differentiate cardiomyocytes as three-dimensional aggregates, forming so-called cardiospheres. The protocol is similar to the one that is used uh, for two-dimensional aggregates. And as you might already know, cardiospheres find also application in phenotypic screening, as they also show um, contractivity and cardiomyocyte-specific um, characteristics. The second way to increase the standardization of the cellular model um, can be done once the differentiation is completed. Differently from what we might expect and as we have already mentioned, uh, PSC differentiation uh, doesn't lead to 100% of correctly differentiated cells. Um, therefore, we end up having in our cell culture dish a heterogeneous mixture of correctly differentiated cells, but also cells with a, a typical phenotype. Having, of course, a homogeneous population is extremely important to have reliable experimental results and to be able to, to measure the response just from the correct target cell. We can overcome this issue by selecting the target cell population so that we can control that the percentage, so the ratio of PSC-derived cells, is consistent among the various experiments that we will perform. Selection of cardiomyocytes can be done with several methods. Um, here you may see the two most uh, widely used ones, either metabolic starvation or not metabolic selection. The first one implies the use of metabolic starvation of non-myocytes uh, by using a media that is glucose depleted and lactated, lactate enriched, uh, so that just cardiomyocytes can survive and therefore be selected. Although this metabolic approach uh, yields up to 99 percent pure cardiomyocytes, the uh, cells are facing the metabolic starvation process and can respond with changes of their properties. A recent paper by um, the Heron group indicates that metabolically uh, selected PSC cardiomyocytes show a phenotype that resembles um, ischemic cardiomyocytes. Therefore, we suggest to use a non-metabolic approach, such as cell isolation by MAX technology. Moreover, the selection of specific cell population by this technology is less time-consuming and more reliable and standardized. So, using the data from a marker screening, we have developed a new approach for highly enriching cardiomyocytes the iPSC-derived cardiomyocyte isolation kit that includes a proprietary cocktail of max microbeads to deplete the non-cardiomyocyte cells. This kit is based on magnetic cell separation and has been designed to work both with cells that have been differentiated with high efficiency, but also with cells that have been differentiated in low efficiency. In uh, this last case, so efficiency below 50%, we would apply first a step where uh, uh, non cardiomyocytes are depleted, and then we will move on with the second step of enriching uh, PSC derived cardiomyocytes. This not only represents a fast method because it takes around one hour, but also consistently delivers pure cardiomyocyte population up to 97% purity that show a consistent phenotype. After directed differentiation, TSC-derived cardiomyocyte can be maintained in culture to meet experimental needs. So also in this case, we want to use specific media that maintain the cells viable and functional. Uh, Stemax Cardiac Cultivation Media XF has been developed for use of our differentiation kit, and cells can be cultured for up to 30 days with every second day feeding in this environment without compromising them. Additionally, this media facilitates uh, a fast recovery after thawing of 
frozen shells, and importantly, does not contain phenol red, so that uh, it has no uh, interference with experimental readouts. Okay, and with this, um, I would like to introduce you Laura, that will uh, talk about the quality control steps that are necessary during the generation of PSC-derived cellular models for screening applications. Thank you, Viola. So the last part of this webinar is all about quality control steps, and I would like to not only show you how crucial it is to include them throughout your work with PCs and their derivatives, but also give you some examples how quality control steps can be easily incorporated into your workflow. Variability between different PC lines and their derivatives is a major riddle in the field and can significantly obscure high throughput screen results. Thus, standardized quality control, or just QC, is not only important to limit this variability, but also to make sure the data is consistent, reproducible, and accurate. As a result, QC steps should be included throughout the workflow, so after reprogramming, to verify that the cells are free from any reprogramming vectors, during maintenance of the PCs, and after differentiating them into the cell type of interest, to not only verify a good quality of the PC culture, but also of their product that can be used for further downstream analysis. With regards to the PCs, multiple critical quality attributes should be addressed. These include confirmation of identity, to demonstrate that the cell line is not cross-contaminated and matches the donor sample, microbiology sterility, to confirm that the cell culture is free of any possible biologic contaminants like bacteria, fungi, and mycoplasm, but also includes attributes like endotoxin, genetic fidelity and stability, viability, as well as characterization to demonstrate the expression of gold standard pluripotent and self-renewal markers, and potency to show that the PC line can give rise to cells from all three germ layers. The lack of quality control could therefore compromise the quality, sterility, and genetic integrity of the cells, but ultimately it creates also a viable that might affect the results. So assays and tools are needed that are cost-efficient, labor-saving, and can be easily incorporated into a workflow for quality control. And this is where flow cytometry comes in as a powerful method that has many advantages over other methods, like for example, immunofluorescence staining. Flow cytometry is a very fast and sensitive method that allows multi-parameter analysis. It's widely used in research and clinical labs for high throughput analysis and can also be automated. By employing further fluorescence labeled antibodies, one can simultaneously detect and quantify multiple intracellular and surface markers on one cell. So next to the flow cytometry itself, the most important component of a flow cytometry experiment comes down to the antibodies. Then by using highly specific antibodies which are conjugated to fluorescence markers, it is possible to identify and quantify the target of interest. So when establishing quality control tests, it is also crucial to use high quality products like antibodies. And our recombinantly generated reaffinity antibodies are not only designed and optimized for flow cytometry, but they also provide superior lot-to-lot -lot consistency and purity due to standardized production, rigorous purification, and stringent quality controls. Also, all rare affinity antibodies contain a specifically mutated human ITG1 FC region to eliminate further background signals. On top of this, they all have the same IgG1 isotype and thus only require one universal isotype control. This greatly reduces then the complexity of experimental planning and all the advantages recombinantly generated reaffinity antibodies offer are beneficial when establishing robust and reliable quality control tests. As already highlighted earlier, the validation of pluripotent stem cell lines is essential so all PC lines must undergo a thorough and comprehensive characterization to assess their good quality. And key tests assess their pluripotency phenotypes, so the expression of stem cell-specific markers, and the functional pluripotency, so the trillionage differentiation capacity. And the characterization of the PC should be performed after reprogramming, as well as routinely in maintenance culture. But how can we determine the pluripotency phenotype and the functional pluripotency by flow cytometry in a fast and easy way? Because establishing multicolor flow cytometry panels can be costly and time consuming. However, tested panels like multinibiotech tested panels or short MBTPs can overcome these issues by providing optimized and pre-designed panels for flow cytometry, which are validated by R&D experts 
to reduce the time spent on panel design and validation. Also, all of the tested panels come with easy-to-use staining protocols. Thus, the MBTPs also increase the standardization and reliability of flow cytometry experiments to characterize PSCs. And an example of a such a panel is shown here on the right that can be used to characterize the pluripotency phenotype of PSC's culture. The panel includes multiple surface marker as well as intracellular marker to characterize human PSCs and distinguish them from differentiated cells. And this flow cytometry panel composed of six antibodies was used here to validate the expression of pluripotency markers in human PCs shown on the left side and non-human PCs. By having a look at the different flow cytometry plots and the heat map below, you can see that the majority of the analyzed PCs showed high expression of pluripotency markers. These include the surface markers SA4, SA5, TAR160, as well as the intracellular markers SOX2 and OCT4. This is further highlighted by the red color in the heat map, where the numbers specify the percentage of single positive, shown in bold, and double positive cells. Instead, the early differentiation marker SA1 was expressed at very low levels, as shown also in the green color. Together, this data confirms the expression of pluripotency markers in the analyzed PC culture and thus a good quality. Instead, in non-human PCs, these pluripotency markers are expressed at low levels, as you can see in the plots as well as in the heat map and by the green color. Also, the functional pluripotency can be assessed in a quantitative and qualitative way by flow cytometry using antibody panels. And this is shown here where four different clones were differentiated towards the mesoderm, ectoderm, and endoderm lineage using the kit presented earlier. Then these differentiated cells were analyzed by flow cytometry using the panel depicted on the right. The panel itself consists of two marker combinations for each germ layer and includes both surface and intracellular markers. And as you can see, the flow cytometric analysis does not only allow to analyze the differentiation potential of many clones in parallel, but also can reveal different propensities of clones. So for example, you can see that clone 1 expressed higher levels of CD184 and SOX17, which marked the definitive endoderm, than clone 2. After differentiating PSCs into the desired cell type, like cardiomyocytes, it is also essential to characterize the differentiated cells to ensure the success of the differentiation, but also to quantify the efficiency, so to determine the percentage of PC-derived cardiomyocytes and to evaluate the presence of subpopulations. Different methods can be used to characterize PC-derived cardiomyocytes, which include IF staining, patch clamp, and flow cytometry. However, flow cytometry, unlike patch clamp and IF staining, is a quantitative and qualitative way to easily characterize PC-derived cardiomyocytes and does not require skilled personnel. As with any other PC-derived culture, cardiovascular cells differentiated from human PC cultures are not homogeneous cell populations. Instead, they are composed of a variety of cardiomyocytes, including different subtypes and non-cardiomyocytes. The different subtypes, including arterial-like and ventricular-like cardiomyocytes, greatly differ in their electrophysiological properties and marker expression profile. Thus, for quality control and any downstream application, it is very crucial to also phenotype the PC-derived cardiomyocytes. We here develop a fully reaffinity antibody panel for flow cytometry to easily assess the quality of your PC-derived cardiomyocyte culture and to distinguish between the different subtypes. Specifically, the panel consists of CM-specific markers like troponin T, beta-actin, and myosin heavy chain, and the cardiomyocyte subtype-specific markers which are myosin light chain 2A and 2V to distinguish between arterial-like and ventricular-like cardiomyocytes. So as you can see, quality control steps are very important throughout the workflow with PSCs, but can be easily achieved by using flow cytometry and antibody panels. And with this, we're actually already at the end of the webinar. So to sum it up, we provide a full workflow for PSC-derived cardiomyocytes which includes reagents and instruments for the cultivation, purification, and cell analysis of PSCs and PSC-derived cardiomyocytes. Our carefully optimized cell culture media, together with good culture in practice, guarantee the maintenance of high-quality PSC cultures. The ready-to-use cardiac differentiation kits have been developed to ensure efficient and scalable cardiac differentiation in 2D and 3D. 
Magnetic purification can be used to further increase the purity and homogeneity of PSC-derived cardiomyocytes. Ultimately, our fast and simple flow cytometry panels can be easily incorporated as quality controls at various steps of the workflow to verify a good quality of PSCs and cardiomyocytes. And altogether, this will greatly advance the experimental success and reproducibility of PSC-based high-throughput screening and drug discovery and toxicology. And with this, thank you very much for your attention and we look forward to your questions.